Okay, we're live. All right. Um, thank you everyone for waiting and hello and welcome to our first Panorama's Roundtable discussion of fall 2020 semester. Um, my name is Kaylin and I'm the Panorama's coordinator for this school year. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Panoramas is an online student-led publication dedicated to the news, research, culture, and arts of Latin America, the Caribbean, Latinx, and Caribbean diasporas. Um, today we'll be hosting a roundtable discussion, and every other week we'll also be hosting a roundtable discussion. So for this semester, our, our roundtables will be today, October 9th and 23rd, November 6th, and November 20th, and they will all be at 4.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. These roundtables will be led mostly by our student interns working with their own research for Panoramas. Uh, very timely with the current pandemic, Abby will be speaking about her article on the impact of COVID-19 on Brazil's indigenous population. After Abby's presentation, we'll open the floor for discussion. Um, Abby is a senior at the University of Pittsburgh, majoring in political science and Spanish with a minor in Portuguese and a certificate in Latin American studies. In addition to being a phenomenal Panoramas intern, she is also the president of Brazil Nux, the Luzo Brazilian Student Association at Pitt. So Abby, would you like to take it away? Okay, let me share my screen um, and then we can get started. Okay, can everybody see my, my screen? If you could give like a thumbs up for, okay. Um, okay, so like Caitlin said, today I will be going um, talk, talking about the impact that COVID-19 is having on Brazil's indigenous population. Um, so to start off, I just wanted to give like a broad overlook of what COVID looks like in Brazil. Um, so a lot of you might already know that Brazil has the third highest number of COVID cases in the world, um, as far as countries are concerned, um, behind the United States and India. Um, I just pulled these numbers from this morning, so they're pretty up to date. Um, as of today, they have 4.6 million cases and over 139,000 deaths. Um, so uh, obviously the entire country of Brazil has been pit, hit pretty hard by the pandemic. Um, and we know already that there's no particular group that's like completely immune to the virus. Um, even the president of Brazil has been infected. But that being said, just like in other countries around the world, um, not all groups in Brazil have been hit the same way. Um, so now let's take a look a little bit at the indigenous COVID cases. So there are about 900,000 roughly um, people who have identified in the Brazilian census as being indigenous. And of that population, um, there have been 33,412 cases and 828 deaths. So if you do the math on this, it turns out to be a death rate that is about 250% higher than the broader Brazilian population, which begs the question of why is this impact so much worse in the indigenous community? So there are a couple of different explanations for this. Um, the first couple can put into this be put into this broader category of isolation. Um, so about half of those 900,000 people who I mentioned live um, in mostly remote um, protected land. Um, most of this land is, um, as you can see in the darker colors on the map, is um, within the Amazon rainforest, so it's kind of hard to get to in a lot of cases. Um, and this has a couple of different consequences. So the first is that since a lot of these locations are so remote, um, they have limited exposure to the pathogens that are present in the broader Brazilian population. So they're not being exposed to the same sorts of viruses and diseases that somebody who lives in Sao Paulo might be exposed to. Um, and what this means is that um, uh, basically COVID is even more foreign to their bodies than it is to our bodies, having not been exposed to as many other types of coronaviruses, like related viruses, um, which means that they can't mount as effective of an immunological response. Um, another issue with isolation is that a lot of uh, communities have to travel a very long distance for medical care. Um, so for example, the Kuikudo tribe has to travel about 100 miles for medical care. Um, this has a couple of different implications. First, if time is of the essence in a medical emergency, obviously having to travel 100 miles is going to be an issue. Um, second, this sort of raises the bar for what actually, what sort of diseases and conditions warrant medical care, um, which can mean that lingering conditions, um, long-term conditions and like minor illnesses can kind of um, stack up on each other over time. And then lastly, it increases the reliance of um, 
of these communities on outside care, which can be a major issue when there's a communicable disease going around. Um, so overall, there is an issue of inaccessibility of healthcare. And beyond that, that's uh, coupled with poor sanitation in a lot of these communities. And the poor sanitation leads to a lot um, higher instances of some more um, common tropical diseases like malaria, dengue, yellow fever, typhoid fever, et cetera. And this makes people um, weaker to begin with when they come in contact with um, a disease like COVID. But you may have noticed that all of these uh, reasons that I just listed are only issues if somebody comes into contact with the virus. Um, so if we think about it, isolation should be a double-edged sword. On one hand, um, if people do get exposed to the virus, they're going to have an increased rate of not being able to survive or recover from the disease. But on the other hand, um, theoretically isolation should protect them as they're not getting exposed as often. Um, however, there is an issue in Brazil that um, basically nullifies a lot of this protection that isolation might otherwise provide. And that is the issue of illegal mining. So as I mentioned before, um, a lot of these people live on um, protected territory, which means that um, at least under the law, um, extractive activities like mining and logging um, shouldn't, aren't permitted. Um, but there are um, like organizations and aspects of the Brazilian government that are designed to enforce these laws, both environmental and indigenous um, organizations within the government. However, um, this has been a point of contention, especially since 2018 with um, the, the, the inauguration of President Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, Bolsonaro has expressed interest in legalizing the currently illegal mining and seems to prioritize the economic benefit that these activities could have over any sort of uh, human or environmental cost that it could come at. Um, so he has basically given um, a subtle green light to a lot of these people, um, these legal miners, to the point that um, a lot of the articles that when you look up this topic, when I was researching it, um, basically describe what's going on in the Amazon right now as a gold rush. Um, so what does this have to do with COVID? Well, if these people are coming in from outside of this territory um, and it's an illegal activity, so it's not being regulated, they're bringing their outside disease. And when there's a pandemic going on that has, um, that often presents itself asymptomatically, this can have some pretty devastating consequences. Um, and a lot of outbreaks have been linked to the illegal miners. Um, for example, the uh, Yamamami communities, um, Experts estimate that about 40% of their communities could be infected just as a result of miners entering their territory. Um, and this is a pretty isolated tribe. And a lot of tribes are pretty similarly threatened and have similar concerns. There was a Supreme Court decision um, that was supposed to sort of rectify the situation. Um, the Supreme Court decision called for a situation room to be created for government officials to deliberate indigenous policy and also called for an end to illegal encroachment into the indigenous territory. However, um, all but one justice within the Brazilian Supreme Court um, declined um, issuing any sort of order or mandate. Um, so this means that there isn't really an enforcement mechanism for this and it's largely just a symbolic commitment with no actual um, required action behind it. Um, so obviously, this is a crisis that the government um, has had to deal with. So here is just a couple of different ways that the government has responded outside of the Supreme Court case. Um, there is um, an agency within the government um, called CESI that is devoted to um, Indigenous health specifically. But this organization has been criticized for um, not being careful enough with who they're allowing to enter the territory. Um, so, for example, there was an incident when four infected SSI staff um, entered the territory without realizing that they were positive for COVID, which later um, tribe leaders claim led to an outbreak within their communities. And the government didn't really do much more than issue a half-hearted um, apology in response to this. Um, they also have continued to allow Christian ministries to operate um, during um, during the pandemic, meaning basically that outsiders are able to come in and evangelize people um, without, e like, even though there's um, an ongoing pandemic. The government has issued um, provisions for the, um, the entire country, um, but 
things like personal protective equipment, tests, and supplies have been really slow to arrive to a lot of Indigenous communities um, because they're so isolated. There is a plan that Bolsonaro had for um, at-risk groups specifically, um, which obviously includes the Indigenous population, but it does lack in some essential provisions, such as providing more hospital beds and um, improving sanitation. And then lastly, um, another issue um, that happened more recently was that the government blocked uh, Doctors Without Borders from entering um, Indigenous territory and entering Brazil entirely um, to help a tribe with their, um, with their preventative measures that they had called Doctors Without Borders to um, deal with. So um, perhaps unsurprisingly, a lot of people have labeled this response as inadequate and some have gone even further with their characterization. Um, there have been, as of the last I checked, five different requests to the International Criminal Court to investigate Bolsonaro for incitement of genocide. Um, it's unclear whether the International Criminal Court will actually do anything with this or if they'll investigate him. But um, in the meantime, people obviously aren't sitting idly by as their loved ones are getting sick and dying. Um, so I have a couple of different tribes, obviously not an exhaustive list, but a couple of different highlights of ways that um, Indigenous communities have been taking ac uh, action on their own. Um, so the Kuikuro tribe, uh, for example, has um, developed a community level contract tracing system with their um, with outside scientists to try to halt the spread within their community. They also have um, been good about creating indigenous language materials to distribute within the community to educate people on the virus. Um, the Kayapo people have, um, back in August, they staged a protest that blocked a major highway to call attention to um, their demands that the government do better in responding to the pandemic, specifically within the indigenous community. Um, these protests did eventually end and the government is supposed to um, pay them um, a certain amount of money. And then lastly, um, the Yamamami people have launched an online movement um, called Miners Out, COVID Out. Um, they're using this hashtag a lot on Twitter to draw attention to, as the name implies, um, the role that miners are having in um, bringing the pandemic to indigenous communities. Um, they're calling for the immediate um, halts of all of these miners out of the territory. Um, and they ha also have a website that has a petition on it. Um, as of the last that I checked, they had a little over 400,000 signatures and they're aiming to get to 500,000. Once they reach their goal, they're planning on sending this petition to um, a lot of high ranking government officials, including the vice president. Um, and this movement is endorsed by Greenpeace Brazil, as well as um, Amnesty International Brazil. So overall, this is obviously an ongoing situation. It's constantly changing, and we don't know um, how, whether the government is going to change course eventually or what the ultimate devastation of all of this is going to be. Um, but what we have seen is that the indigenous people are continuing to fight um, as they always have throughout history. Um, so I have a couple of discussion questions just as food for thought um, that you all can look at um, if you so choose, but if anybody has any questions, comments, um, or insight that they'd like to offer, um, please feel free to speak up at this time. I have a question. Um, so we've seen in the United States that even people who survived COVID tend to have really horrible after effects. Like I remember one study that was done showing that even college football players who are in like prime health still have myocarditis after the infection. So do you think that the isolation the indigenous people's experience and the lack of access to healthcare could make those after effects of COVID even worse than they are for people up here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Since they already aren't having like some of these underlying conditions that we've seen have made COVID worse in a lot of people, um, since they're not receiving regular treatment for that, um, I can imagine that a lot of these long-term implications are going to be even worse if they have like a heart, like a lower starting point and a um, less healthy starting point to begin with. Um, the after effects are only going to be worse after that. Abby, I have a question. 
Mm -hmm. So if you said like some of this international aid was rejected by Brazil, not well, like does, or it was rejected by Bolsonaro, but does Bolsonaro like get to make the decision for the indigenous groups? Like, do they have their own um, separate entity, like a political entity or are they like really part of Brazil? Like why don't um, they make the decision themselves basically? So there definitely are um, a lot. They definitely have like their own community organization and their own tribal organization and leaders. Um, but ultimately, like it, since it's an international group, I think the issue was that like obviously Bolsonaro and his government have control over the borders and who's like entering and leaving the country. So even though they may have um, a bit more autonomy than a lot of other groups have within Brazil, um, at the end of the day, uh, like the federal government is the one controlling the who comes in and out of their country. And so he was able to block that and they couldn't really do much about it. Interesting. Okay. Hey, Abby. Um, I have a comment. Um, I was actually leaving there until a month ago. <laughs> so I was in the middle of it when uh, COVID came. And I do think that the president has a lot to do, like he was very responsible because we knew that COVID was already spreading in the country and he didn't stop any um, transportation to come into the Amazon. So through that, we knew that it was because of one of those boats that comes from Manaus to Tabatinga that we got the virus into Tabatinga and Leticia in Colombia because it's a, it's a border area. And it cost, it was, it was a, like, it took, it took a month more for the virus, the virus to actually hit the population. And it cost not, not, not just the number of people that died, but also the kind of people that you lose because of this. We lost, for example, an actor, like a very, very, like the, the actor that was in the first Colombian movie nominated for an Oscar because it's a story in the Amazon. So you lose these people that are living libraries, that have all this knowledge, that are the only ones that still have all this experience and knowledge. And it's very, it was very painful. It was very scary to know that uh, we went from having no cases to having 2,000 people contage in two weeks. That's the level of spread that we were facing. Luckily, because of the context, actually, we didn't use uh, Occidental Western uh, medicine as much. People, we just uh, shift into natural uh, medicine. So actually, um, when, by the time I left, pretty much everybody was healed and like 90% of the people not only su survived, but it was controlled. So at this moment, they are not, they don't have, I think there's like 10 cases reported at the moment because of not everybody was like drinking their aguapanela and garlic and ginger and a lot of other plants using natural vaporizations to clean their respiratory uh, system. So I do think that the president has a lot of responsibility because he didn't act in the moment. He didn't like cut any, like for remote these areas are, they're still connected. And that was what, what everybody was asking, like stop, stop the flying, to stop the shift, the chips for coming. And he didn't. So uh, I, I hope this actually goes through and that he has some consequences coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that on the ground insight. That's um, really, I mean, I'm sorry that you had to go through all of that, um, but that's, it is very interesting insight to hear exactly like what it's like on the ground. Um, it is interesting what you mentioned about losing the actor because I did find um, in a lot of the research that I was doing for this that um, a lot of the people who they were interviewing within the communities um, were really deeply concerned about the idea of losing elders within their community because like you said they are like living libraries and they do possess so much wisdom and they're so well respected within these communities 
Um, and a lot of times their lives were the ones to be in jeopardy because they're, a lot of times they were older um, and more susceptible to um, being infected and having severe consequences from the virus. But thank you so much for sharing that. Does anybody else have any um, comments or um, questions that they'd like to ask? Um, I kind of wanted to comment on, I think it's really interesting in like the economic context in the sense of like, I think that right now the current administration in Brazil is very like economically motivated. And I think that kind of like like de-incentivizes them to like do anything about this particular problem because um, especially with coronavirus, like a lot of economies are down. So like, I feel like they're even less likely to want to keep those um, indigenous communities like isolated because like they want miners and like people who are going to like boost the economy. So I think it adds an extra element of like, like I honestly, like it kind of shows like that, and it's not just in Brazil and a lot of places like um, they value like money and financial gain over like the lives of people. And like, I think it's becoming very clear like during this pandemic that like, that's where a lot of the priorities are. Because I mean, if they were to, like I said, like stop um, like mining activities and like stuff like that to stop, to like halt the spread in these indigenous communities, like it would have economic repercussions. And I feel like in the current um, like economic atmosphere, like that's not something that the current administration like would ever be willing to do because like I think that the economy is so important to them and I think it just adds a layer of like something like difficulty to overcoming the problem. Yeah absolutely that's a really interesting insight of like connecting the mining to um to the pandemic and like the economic hardship that has come as a result of the pandemic. Um, that's a really interesting insight. And I think that that has been, the concern of the economy has been really, really evident in Bolsonaro's response to COVID, like him specifically, though obviously we've seen that around the world, um, that he rushed it off, um, like his initial response was just to brush it off and say like, it's a little flu, you don't need to worry about it. Um, we need to keep everything open and basically just pretend that this doesn't exist because if we don't then the economy is going to suffer and that was like his justification was specifically talking about um how they didn't want to do anything in response to the pandemic just because um he didn't want the economy to suffer as a result so that's um definitely a huge part of it um and i know that like in the past like with the Bolsonaro administration, there's been a lot of problems like unrelated to the pandemic of just like um, encroaching on like supposedly protect protected lands. And like he's made comments about like he doesn't, like in past administrations, they've um, like added new protected lands for the indigenous people. And like Bolsonaro has like claimed like, I won't be adding any more. Like basically like they have enough protected land, like they don't need more. And like in a kind of messed up way, I feel like he like this is like kind of achieving like what he wants like of he's able to like encroach on the indigenous land because they're like at a weak point right now and like so I just I agree this is a huge problem but I honestly don't foresee like Bolsonaro himself like doing anything about it like if anything's going to be done it's going to be like from other avenues you know what I mean yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I do agree with you that it's kind of hard to see him changing course on something like this, especially since, like you said, even prior to the pandemic, his stance on, on this whole issue was pretty clear. Um, like I mentioned, he does want to legalize a lot of these activities that are currently illegal. And um, I mean, he's his record on environmental issues is um, pretty pro-business over environment. Um, so I think that like what he's doing right now, even though it's having, obviously it's having awful consequences, but um, it's pretty consistent with what his rhetoric and what his actions have been over the past two years of his presidency, for sure. Um, I would also, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Jeff, but I would also just like to point out that we do have somebody who has worked as a nurse here. 
uh, or has worked as a nurse in indigenous communities. So I don't know if you have any um, personal insight that you'd like to offer since you're here. Hi, so I, I, I work at a street outreach office and I was just thinking where, um, when I was going to be able to speak or can I, um, I can I share my experience now? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. So um, I am from Sajipi. My family is also, um, has also indigenous background. And um, before uh, talking about my work, I have to mention uh, briefly about the indigenous communities in Sajipi. Um, back in the 19th century, uh, we had uh, mainly six um, indigenous villages from the north to the south, São Pedro do Porto da Folha, Pacatuba, Japaratuba, Aguazeda, Jeru, and Chapada. And like um, the historical facts, facts that happened in Brazil, um, those indigenous people also lost their land um, to um, agrarian oligarchs. Nowadays, there is only one in the indigenous community left in Sergipe, the Chacos, and they um, are located 220 kilometers away from Aracaju. And Aracaju is the capital of Sergipe. And there are only 325 remaining indigenous people um, living in that village nowadays. And they are already mixed because of um, as consequences of slavery and racial mixing. So over time they lost, um, they kind of lost that essential culture from the ancestors and also their um, phenotyp phenotypic resemblance. Um, so I work at the out street out outreach office, like I said, and it was created in June of 2015, and its purpose is to provide health and social services to vulnerable communities and individuals. Um, therefore, our patients include um, people in homelessness situation, um, sex workers, Brazilian indigenous, Afro-Brazilians, and also immigrants. And um, a lot of those immigrants are also indigenous from um, other Latin American countries. Um, when these indigenous people is, um, become homeless, they are at risk of alcohol and other drugs, STIs and infectious diseases, violence, police, um, brutality. And my job is to go on the streets um, to meet them and provide health and social care and social um, justice for them. Um, during the pandemic, my team and I went to the streets to also um, do COVID testing. And basically, this is how it works. When um, someone is diagnosed with COVID, we bring them to a COVID shelter uh, or to the hospital if they are um, critical. The City Hall of Aracaju, in collaboration with the Department of Health and the Department of Social Services, they provided four, um, four emergency shelters um, for these people. The Escola Fritas Brandão, UCRAS, Terezinha Meira, Centro Espiritual Lava Amazonas. Um, we have a school that is closed because of the pandemic, and that school became a, um, a temporary shelter. And in fact, that those actions are working because we only had 10, um, 10 deaths um, of COVID from March to now. It could be worse, you know, but we were, we were able to protect them and um, provide health for them. So um, we did not have as much losses as um, it, it uh, could have. Um, you know, Bolsonaro, um, like um, 
you said like everybody um the world already knows he's a genocide like um he's basically that even though he he's in court like he is um, he's on the spot now for that but we all know this is his main purpose um the the main purpose of his political agenda is the death of uh, people from low-income communities and people um, of color, like indigenous people and Afro-Brazilian people. And um, it is scary because his political actions resembles the Nazi movement. But it's also dumb because Bolsonaro is Latino, you know? He would be killed by the Nazis. Um, so it's a very... Um, weird situation that um, it's a very it's a very weird government now um, and I have one article of the Brazilian Constitution I want to mention before I wrap up it's the article 196 of the Brazilian Constitution of 88 it says, health is a right of all and a duty of the state and shall be guaranteed by means of social and economic policies aimed at reducing the risk of illness and other hazards and at the universal and equal access to actions and services for its promotion, protection, and recovery. So Jair Bolsonaro is literally going against um, our constitution. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing um, your experience. It's really helpful in having this discussion to hear um, both from you and Mariana, like what it's like um, on the ground. Um, and thank you so much for doing the work that you're doing within those communities. Um, I actually didn't know that the it was like a constitutionally enshrined right to um, have health and be able to be healthy and have um, the resources to do so. Um, yeah. So that's very interesting. Our thank constitution, you. Um, um, not only provides health for Brazilians, but also for foreigners that are here for legal and illegal and for like vacation. Anyone that comes here that gets in the country, they have the right to receive medical treatment. Yeah, that's, I had no idea about that, but that's um, very interesting um, to hear that that's like a constitutionally enshrined right, but Again, yeah. thank you so much for coming and for sharing your personal experiences. Um, You're welcome. Abby, I have a comment. Yes. Um, it, it's just related also to what Jeff is, uh, just said. Um, like I read maybe in June or sometime in June or yeah, I think it was around June that um, the prevalence of coronavirus among indigenous population within that lived in cities in urban areas uh, was five times more than compared to the population in general. I'm not sure if you said that at the beginning of your presentation because I missed the beginning of it. Um, and and because and also they are not notified. And if cases are not notified there's lack of public policies. So mm -hmm. I totally agree with Jefferson. What's happening is absurd. My hope is that the president, you know, something happens, right? That because what he is doing is, is genocide, literally. Not mm -hmm. only, I think, in the indigenous area that we all know in the Amazon, but also in urban cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I didn't specifically note that statistic. I didn't know that specific statistic, but it's interesting because um, at the beginning I had a slide that talked about the cases and the deaths um, within the indigenous communities. Um, and the state actually doesn't, the state, when they track their COVID cases, they only, um, for when they're going by ethnicity, they only basically um, include the people who are living in indigenous territory as like indigenous COVID cases. So I actually had to get the numbers for the accurate 
the more accurate numbers are considered to be by this nonprofit organization called APIB that has, um, that includes both the indigenous people in the more um, remote areas, but also the indigenous people in the city. Yeah, Abby, actually, like, there is so much racial mixing that um, we cannot defer, like, oh, this person is indigenous, this person is Afro-Brazilian, you know, um, but one thing, they have one thing in common, they are vulnerable, their health um, is like, their health-related um, vulnerable to COVID and other infectious diseases and to um, drug abuse, especially the ones that are in, um, in a homeless situation. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, obviously this presentation focused specifically on the indigenous people, but it is worth noting that um, indigenous people in Brazil are definitely not the only people who um, have been disproportionately affected compared to the general population. Um, like you said, there are a lot of different um, communities, like the Afro-Brazilian communities, um, that have had similar, um, similarly higher death rates and similar devastation and similarly haven't received the medical care that they need um, as nearly as often as um, white Brazilians, for example, had, or have been able to access. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so. Um, this neglect of like indigenous communities um, and like their needs, um, I think is a trend that can be observed throughout Latin America. Um, so for example, in La Guajira, which is um, in the Northeast region of Colombia, there is the Waju community um, and they have a very weak like medical system. So just to like give an example. Um, so this kind of goes like based off of the first question that you have um, there, like posted on your screen. Um, so do you have any like idea of how the Brazilian government has like compared, like their actions has compared to other like Latin American governments um, in relation to their indigenous communities? Yeah, so um, a case that, or like a country that I um, read into a bit was specifically talking about, um, well, both Peru and Colombia, but especially Peru, that they have been having um, a pretty similar issue. Um, I read specifically about their indigenous population within the um, their portion of the Amazon, um, that they do have the issue of um, not having a very robust medical system within these areas. Um, and the government has basically neglected to improve these places and improve their medical um, medical situation. So it is, there definitely is a trend, I would say both in Latin America and in the United States too, and other countries that have indigenous populations of neglecting their indigenous population um, during the pandemic, which obviously isn't something that's exclusive to the pandemic, but we have been seeing a lot of neglect. Um, I would say that one thing that kind of separates um, Brazil is just um, how heavily, like the, the illegal mining and how heavily Bolsonaro has favored economics throughout all of this um, is something that I think sets him specifically apart because I feel like he's especially neglectful and ex exceptionally like more concerned about those issues than some other leaders may be. Um, but it definitely is something that we've been seeing across the board throughout Latin America and more broadly worldwide. Thank you. Hey, Abby, to complete that, I would say that um, there is, like, Bolsonaro has definitely, like, been full frontal in how much he doesn't care. Mm -hmm. But, like, in Colombia, they've been saying, like, yeah, we care. But then we have another problem. And because these regions are so remote and, like, information is so difficult to gather then corruption is just there so even if governments are trying to uh, enforce like the medical system never like money never actually gets there um, our hospital for example they immediately start working on it and to build an ICU unit like because we only had one like one ICU bed so they immediately start working on the hospital to make a whole room area for COVID cases and have a whole IC unit with at least five beds. Well, we had the pick, we had 
2,500 people contagious at the same time and nothing happened. By the time I left, I told you like people were mostly recovered. And so far as I know today, that hospital is just like not touched. So wow. corruption is another thing that is really hard. Like in these remote areas, people don't care because they know that information is never going to come out in the media. Wow. And yeah, thank you again for your insight on um, having been there personally. Um, yeah, that definitely is corruption is a major issue. And like you said, um, how remote these communities are kind of makes it um, not only is it difficult for information to come out um, in and out of these places, but also it's easier for the broader population and the government to kind of ignore um, if they're not kind of right in your face all the time and they're more out there and um, not as visible within the population. Abby, I have a question, kind of one of the questions that you posed in your discussion questions, like what if anything should the international community be doing to deal with this situation? Like. I don't know if you found anything in your research or if Mariana or Jeff, you can touch on this since you're on the field and you know it, or you've been on the field and you know it, um, what, what can be done? Um, yeah, um, I'm obviously, as I mentioned before, with the whole Doctors Without Borders issue, there is um, an issue with the international community, like, NGOs specifically being able to come in and help that's kind of limited by the Brazilian government. Um, they did, I, so there is obviously the possibility that these NGOs can come in, um, but it is kind of difficult to have like an international response that's specifically targeting, like if we're talking about like something like the UN or something stepping in, it's kind of difficult to have them specifically target Brazil because like we were talking about in um, like a previous question that this is an issue like indigenous communities being negatively like disproportionately affected by COVID is something that's seen um, pretty broadly across um, Latin America and um, around the world. So um, whether it, it's basically it's kind of precarious whether or not the international community can do anything but I think that um, the biggest hope is with international NGOs stepping in and hopefully um, the government allowing them to come in. I know that some um, communities have specifically requested that these NGOs come in. Um, and I don't know if Mariana or Jeff, if you have anything to add to that. No. Um, does anybody else have any? Um, I would say that by the time we were there, um, there were like because of curfew and that nobody like was allowed to out, go out and most of these people depend on daily jobs that they have on like informal working um what own ngos could do was bringing in food that's pretty much what they were doing like just bring food so people could stay home and stay isolated other than that if you if you have like there's so much paperwork there's like all these legal steps that you have to go through. So just like in any other country, just no, no international agency can just come in and, and try to interfere in the health system. So it is very difficult because whatever legal paperwork, it is always involved. Yeah, uh, thank you again for your insight. Um, does anybody else have any uh, questions or comments that they'd like to add to the discussion? Um, I can say something. Um, this isn't really related to COVID, but I thought earlier um, it was super interesting how a couple people talked about a really good point about how Bolsonaro is more economically driven in contrast uh, to really anything. Um, and I re recently started learning about how you know, history has shown long-term effects of this lack of caring for nature. Um, and, and if you take Mexico City, for example, um, when the Spaniards stole the land from the Aztecs way back when, um, now the area doesn't have its forests. It's covered by roads and highways and buildings and they drained the nearby lakes. And now the city, the entire city is sinking. 
um, as water leaves the ground beneath it and about 20% of the city doesn't have access to water from the tap. And in a population of millions, that's a lot of people. Um, and even if you look at the Amazon, logging and mining and roads and dams have all led to the displacement of the indigenous populations. And now the Amazon is absorbing significantly less carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than it had been years ago. And I read an article that talked about soon, unless something is done, the Amazon will produce more CO2 than it absorbs. And it just shows that yes, we as human beings are intelligent and powerful, but there's only so far we can push the health of our planet and the indigenous population before it's too late to turn back. And unfortunately it is these people like Bolsonaro who are in charge who are responsible in taking action against these things. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, that is another really important consequence of um, all of these things that are bringing in COVID are also having this really awful consequence for um, the environment. I um, can't remember the number off the top of my head, but um, I did mention in the article that the deforestation that has happened just within like the beginning of um, this year has been like shocking um, and it's having a really negative impact on the environment and with um, the, at the rate that things are going without having any sort of environmental regulation really being enforced by the government, um, the Amazon is really reaching a point where um, like almost past the point of no return, which will have really devastating consequences for um, not just those local communities, but the um, entire planet because it's such a huge carbon sink right now. Um, and I saw that Manuel had his hand raised. Can just do that, or if yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's me. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Um, so, so Abby, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I I cut out for a, a few minutes, and uh, and so I don't know if you covered this part, but there's the something that that is seldom considered has to do with the regional aspect, right? Because Brazil is not just it's you know the world doesn't fall off the edge of the borders in Brazil, but rather there's these countries that have porous borders, that have indigenous populations that migrate back and forth and that are being affected tremendously by everything that's going on in Brazil and, and may not have much recourse because, you know, Brazil at one point had laws that were um, actually actively uh, pursued um, sometimes you know, not when it was inconvenient, but but actively pursued and on the books. And, and in neighboring countries, sometimes those laws really are not even at that level. And so it's having a regional impact that is way beyond, um, you know, just Brazil at this point. Yeah, and um, Mariana did touch upon that um, when she was talking about her experience of how some of the things that um, Bolsonaro was doing and like his lack of um, enforcement of um, trucks coming into um, coming into the Amazon was within Brazil was causing cases to come into Colombia. Um, I did read about that in some of my research um, for the roundtable that there definitely is an issue just like within the like tri border area like tri state area, if you will, of um, Brazil, Peru, and Colombia that um, it is like affecting that entire region um, regardless of borders. Um, and I think some countries have attempted to um, kind of keep Brazil's problems out of their country um, by blocking the border, um, though I'm not sure how effectively that's being enforced and um, if that's helping at all. But I know that um, I think it was Colombia that was trying to um, block their Brazilian border to try to um, keep that issue, keep the um, fluidity from becoming such an issue. Um, because like you said, it is um, a pretty fluid area and there's a lot of people and um, things moving within that area, even though there are technically um, international borders there. But yeah, that's a really important insight. Um, yeah, and, and you know, and, and there's the other part of it, um, you know, of course, Peru, Colombia, you know, they're, they're countries that we always keep in mind, but there's these small countries, um, you know, Suriname, um, uh, Guyana, um, and French Guiana, and those have significant and important indigenous populations that are now isolated from their Brazilian 
um, relatives even, you know? And, and so it's, it's breaking down beyond, let's say, the health implications and the economic impact. It's, it's um, you know, inf having an influence on social bonds as well. Yeah, that's a really important point. Um, that just like the devastation that it has on like the concept of community. And I mean, I think we've seen that um, both in this instance and just generally the idea of having to be away from your family for so long just to try to isolate and try to prevent people from getting sick, how people haven't like seen their grandparents or seen older relatives or older people within their community just because they don't um, want to get them sick and have them die. Um, so it definitely, I think we're, a while away from being able to see what how devastating not only the health impact of this is but also what the psychological um and community impact of covid ends up being but yeah that's a really really good point and i think we have time for one or two more comments or questions if anyone has anything Okay, well, that's fine. Um, I wanted to say thank you so much to Abby. That was a wonderful presentation, a wonderful discussion. Um, and to those of you who shared your experiences and to everyone who attended, thank you so much. Um, I think it's a very, it's a small sliver of a silver lining that we're remote and this is a virtual discussion um, that we can have guests who otherwise, who from all around the world who otherwise wouldn't have been able to make it to Posver Hall. Um, so thank you all again so much. And um, I just wanted to, to talk about Panoramas a little bit and that even though our site is on a brief hiatus, um, we're not posting regularly right now because we're getting a new site. Um, please stay tuned for our next roundtable discussion, which again will be on um, October 9th, Friday, October 9th at 4.15 p.m. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that quite soon. And Again, any upcoming articles that we'll do any roundtable discussions on, you will receive um, beforehand. And they'll be posted on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and um, in our newsletter. So please be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. I'll post the handles in the chat. And as again, a special thank you to Abby for leading such a wonderful discussion and for all of our guests who shared our, their insights. Um, so thank you all. And I look forward to seeing you all again in a few weeks. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Abby. Bye. Thanks, Abby.